Okay, so we're going to do our third week of Ask the Pastor Anything. We're going to try and get through seven questions, which is ambitious, so we'll see how this goes. But um, just again, the ground rules are people have submitted questions. We're going to answer them. Give the other pass. Each pastor will take a lead on a question. The other pastor gets a little bit to answer if he wants to. And then if you guys have thoughts, we're going to open the mic up for just a short amount of time so we can get through each question. Um, And yeah, we would love to hear any feedback that you guys have on the questions. We may have to move on quickly if, you know, um, to get to all the questions, but we'd love to hear what y'all think. Um, Brandon, are you doing the mic? Can you do the mic in? Okay. You're the man. I always forget to ask him until like right now. He just. All right, so let's get after it. Scott's got the first one, which is a little bit of a humorous one, so here we go. Whoop. There we go. Um, that is the most important question I wanted to put it, start off with it. When, when, when at a Mexican restaurant, when it comes to prayer, should it be done before the meal or before the chips and salsa or both? So, y'all know when I answer a question, I got to give a whole historical context with oh it. Gosh. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, for those that hold to uh, kind of an end times view of, you know, future tribulation and then a rapture or whatever, there's what's called, you know, some believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, some believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, and some believe in a post-tribulation uh, rapture. So, when it comes to Mexican restaurants and eating chips and when you pray, there's what you call pre-chip, mid-chip, and post-chip. And uh, so I usually, I, I say I hold the post, post-chip, um, I think, in, 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 uh, in the case of Mexican restaurants only, only Mexican restaurants, uh, you can go ahead and partake in the chips. Because um, what ends up happening is, is those who are pre-chip and they take that, that point of view, Usually they end up being mid-chip because they realize halfway through eating chips they never said a prayer, and so they, uh, yeah, so I, I just take the post-chip position, so that's my answer. I don't think we need any follow-up to that. I think we can move on. Yeah. That was a tough one. That took him a lot of thought. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Does it apply to roles, though? That's a whole other discussion. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, Okay, this is a great question. I really appreciated the person asking this. I don't know who it was, but it says, if someone doesn't have family close by, works without coworkers, I'm guessing like a a remote job or something, and all of their friends are already plugged into the church, are they doing something wrong by not having a wider circle of people to share God with? It's a good question. I think you could summarize it like, if all your friends and family are Christians— and you're not hanging out with people who don't go to church or don't know God a whole lot, or you're doing something wrong. And I, I thought it was a cool question, because I feel like the person who asked this must have a heart for people who don't know God, and I thought that was really cool. Um, I'm going to answer this in three parts, uh, quickly. The first, the overall answer to this is no. You're not doing something wrong if you are not coming into contact with people who don't know God all the time. Not necessarily are you doing something wrong. Because there's all kinds of reasons why you're, you could be doing good things. Just for example, you could be a stay-at-home mom, taking care of your family, thus taking up so much of your time. You're raising godly children, and you don't have time to hang out with people at the bar or something like that, people who don't know God. And that's not a bad thing. You could be working in an orphanage in Africa and spending all your time with orphans. Like, there's so many good reasons why you might not come into contact with people who don't know God on a regular basis. Um, so I would say the only way you're disobeying God is if, well, the only way you're not right is if you're disobeying God. Like if he's telling you to go witness to somebody or go be somewhere and you're not doing it, that would be something. Um, but otherwise, I don't think necessarily you're wrong. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to point out something just out of this question that I think is easy to overlook because it's a good thing we do care about people who are outside the church, people who don't have a relationship with God. But something that I think is important to remember is that the Bible talks a whole lot. Like, you could spend a sermon just talking about the verses that talk about ministering to people in the church. So this verse is a great example. It says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. So you should do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. 
Another one that's a good example is um, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And I think this is important because I think of this like, like a good analogy that stands out to me is like steroids. Like when you look at somebody who's on steroids, they look like the picture of health. Okay. They're fit. They're muscular. They can go to the gym and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, But a lot of people who take steroids have a lot of issues internally that are unhealthy. And once you begin to discover how they're getting this muscular physique and what it's costing them, you really don't want any part of it. Um, And that can happen in the church. The church can do all these cool programs that people outside are like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. I want to go check that out. But if the people in the church are not loving each other, if there's decay and unhealthy stuff going on inside the church, the people who come in are going to figure that out and say, I don't want any part of that and leave. And then it would have been better if they had never come at all than to have that bad picture of what the church is like. And so it is incredibly important that we love each other. Like, this is, the people sitting in this room are people that we're going to spend eternity with. We're going to spend eternity with each other. And we're supposed to learn here and now how to start loving each other. That is so important. And so what I wanted to say to the person who is feeling like they're surrounded by just believers and they don't have a lot of contact with the outside or people who don't know God, I want to encourage you to take advantage of your opportunity to serve your brothers and sisters around you. Don't just think, well, I can't serve God because I don't know people who don't know him. Serving the people who do know him, your brothers and sisters, loving them, being intentional about ministering to them in whatever way you can, that's huge. That is so important. And anyone can do that, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or anybody like that. You know, you can be intentional about loving the people in the church that God has given you. Does that make sense? And I think that's, that's huge. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I got. Oh, and I made it. I made it in four minutes. All right. Uh, yeah, good word, Luke. Um, I believe in balance. Uh, I think, you know, just like a lot of things, we can, um, we can, we can be. You know, like you have introverts and extroverts, right? Uh, within the church, we can be um, two. I've, I've been a part of churches where it's all evangelistic, right? That it missed the point that that we are the body and um, um, and and that we're. Just like we were talking about this morning, this is the lighthouse. This is where we come to be fed and, and worship cor- corporately. I mean, the church, by definition, is God's people, the assembly of God, you know. But also at the same time, we can, be, we can become too um, inner circle, you know what I mean? And it can be all about us, you know. And so uh, just my uh, quick answer, I, I think, um, <clears throat> like Luke said, there's, there's situations where, uh, you know, it may be difficult and we're feeling the shame you know, about not knowing people, and that's, that's just what our, our situation is. But, you know, we just have to ask ourselves, is, is, there, is there something I can do differently? Do I need to, to befriend uh, lost people um, more? Because that's something, you know, that I, I think about, you know, all the time is, is um, am I intentionally, I mean, am I, am I slipping into a place of comfort where I'm not, I'm so comfortable with, with Christians that I'm not getting out and getting getting messy. Um, and I don't mean getting worldly when I say getting messy, but, you know, we're in the world, but not of the world, right? And we're to be lights um, in the world. So I think it's a healthy, it's a healthy balance in, in the church. This Sunday is, is, is about us, but yeah, inviting people. Well, Sabrina, you knock my socks off with the people that you, you invite. You know, some people are, though, I, I believe are more gifted, you know, at that, but also at the same time, just like evangelists. We're not all evangelists, but we all are called to interact with the lost world and to share share the gospel. So a good healthy balance. And I think only we can answer that with us and the Holy Spirit, you know, um, where we're at on, on that. Cool. Anybody got thoughts about that? They want to pitch in? Someone in the back there. Kevin. Kevin. Oh, Real, did you have something to say? Yeah, I have a yeah, quick go question. For it. Um, how much time do we have for questions so I can keep an eye on the clock? Like per question? Uh, well, we try to keep it to five minutes total. Yeah, here, five minutes of questions. Yeah, and, okay. and Luke will kind of say last question or whatever. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it was Kevin. Uh, I was just going to say that 
if you're, you know, if you're that person that that question described, you can choose, you know, your everyday moments, like when you go to Walmart or whatever, where when you're out in public, you know, just look for opportunities to share. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, one thing I didn't say, but I, because I wanted to finish, but one thing I think is really helpful with all of this is not condemning yourself for where you're at, but just asking God to help you be available whenever, you know, whenever an opportunity arises, asking God to help you be available and sensitive to that. Anybody else before we move on? Run, Brandon, run. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I'm in Tom out over here in the corner, sorry. Uh, the, I also think that it depends on the season of life you're in a lot of times. Um, like, I, I know for me, since I've been through a lot more seasons than a lot of people in here, uh, that as the, during the season that I was a busy, busy mom, I might not necessarily have been able to engage and plug into things that kind of uh, took me outside of the home, you know, where there were people to uh, really, you know, encounter and talk to or whatever. I mean, there were days, because I played mom and dad, both when Kevin would be gone on a TDY, that I literally felt like I need an adult to talk to here. Uh, But I think that, um, like you said, not condemning yourself because it's, you're in a, a spot that is not conducive to you being able to do that. You have to kind of, you know, evaluate each each and every person would have to evaluate it for themselves. Is, is are you in that situation out of your choosing uh, because it's outside of your comfort zone? Do you need to stretch yourself a little bit uh, to to intentionally engage with people, uh, or do you uh, are you just like just so consumed with a full schedule that you're just not able to squeeze in another thing? Um, so I know it seems very odd that I would say I'm more of an introvert. I am in my natural, more of a shy person. And so I had to learn to step outside of my comfort zone to really even engage in conversation with people. Uh, and so for, for that, yes, that's a personal thing that I had to work on, uh, where I became more comfortable in my own skin in order to do that. And then I look at someone like Sabrina, where she has just that personality that seems so bubbly and she may very well tell me that at one point she may have struggled with that reaching out stage two I don't know but you just have some people that have that gift they are just just innately created to be an extrovert Um, and I think that those that comes easy to people like that but for people that are more like myself naturally it is not easy and so you just practice it that, I, I do say that it does get more comfortable and it does get easier when you practice it because I'm there, as you can see now, I'm not really having any qualms about speaking. Yeah. Good word, Thank Robbie. You. That was Thanks. well said. You know, yeah. there, there could be, maybe I'll preach a sermon on it one day because I, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things to talk about on, on, on both sides to get a good healthy, healthy balance on the, on the issue. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> why did Michael argue with Satan over... Moses's body. I'm so interested to hear the answer to this one. Yeah. Uh, well, the question comes from Jude, and uh, so uh, in Jude um, one eight through ten, um, he says, "Yet in like manner, these uh, these people also relying on their dreams." He's talking about false teachers that have infiltrated the church and teaching a bunch of um, uh, bad teachings. So he says. Yet, in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams, they defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Uh, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, uh, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand uh, instinctively. So, the short answer is the Bible doesn't say. <laughs> yeah. Because literally this quote isn't in, in the Bible, what he's quoting. The story isn't in the Bible. It's from an extra biblical uh, source, probably from uh, what's called the assumption of, of Moses. Um, that doesn't mean like 
Moses made an assumption. It's, it's about Moses being uh, taken up after he, he died. It's an extra-biblical source, a non-canonical book. And Jude quotes <laughs> one chapter. It's like one of the shortest books in all of the Bible. And he quotes from two extra-biblical sources. He quotes from the Assumption of Moses, and he quotes from the book of Enoch in Jude 1, 14 through 15. Why does he, why does he do that? Well, uh, it was, first of all, it was familiar sources to his audience. The Jews were very familiar um, with these two uh, writings, and so, you know, in those sources, there was something that was going to drive home the point that he wanted to make. Um, it's possible he might have even been using the same books that these false teachers were using. Uh, they could have been te- teaching some stuff uh, from these books, and so it's possible that, that, um, that Jude went to the same source to make his, his point, his counter uh, point uh, to them. Um, so the context of why they were, uh, you know, uh, Michael and... and, and, and um, Satan were arguing over the body of Moses. The point isn't clear um, because the point that Jude is trying to make, he's not focused on why they were you know, arguing over the body of Moses. He's, he's, the point he's making is Michael's attitude. Um, uh, false teachers in the church were speaking foolishly and arrogantly um, about the spiritual realm. I don't know what they were saying, but they were very arrogant about the spiritual realm. One, they were denying Christ, and whatever they were saying about angels and uh, spiritual beings was very arrogant. And uh, so he makes the point that even Michael, when rebuking Satan, deferred to God. And instead of saying, I rebuke you, he says, the Lord rebuke you. I don't know if it's, you know, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong to say, I, I, you know, I rebuke you, but he's just talking about the humility of Michael and driving home the point that these false teachers did not have humility. And even speaking of, you know, evil spirits, which we have power over in Christ, right? Um, they, you know, they speak arrogantly. There's no respect, you know, uh, for the power, you know, that these spiritual realities have. And so they were just arrogant and, and, um, and so that's the point that Michael's, uh, not Michael, but Jude is, is, is making. So the story of this argument between Moses and Michael, or between uh, um, Satan and Michael over the body of Moses, it might not even be true. Um, like the Jews wrote these, they wrote these stories. The Old Testament is full of these extra biblical uh, stories called the Midrash, right? And what they would do is they would, you know, um, fill in the gaps. For instance, you know, uh, there was Nephilim before the, uh, the story of the flood. Well, then there's Nephilim afterwards, you know, right? And so when Jews, when they would wrestle with Scripture, they'd say, well, how did that happen? So they would write a story about how the Nephilim survived the flood. It's not a true story. It's just to fill in the gap, something they were totally comfortable with. Um, so it's possible this story might not even be true, or it could be very much true, and it's just lost, and we don't have access to it. And if it's lost, then obviously God you know, doesn't think it's important for us to, to know um, right now. So why were they fighting over the body of Moses if it was true, or what, or what was the point in the original story? We don't know. Maybe Satan wanted to tempt others to worship Moses uh, like he did. Uh, there's another place in the Bible where, where people in Israel started worshiping that, you know, that staff with the serpent on top of it? That's a whole other story, but later on, that staff was still around and people started worshiping it. Maybe that was the point. Um, maybe Satan was arguing for rights um, to Moses. You know, he's the accuser, and you know how Moses disobeyed God, and so he couldn't go into the promised land. And so maybe in that story, you know, Satan was arguing over his, you know, his um, eternal um, uh, state or whatever. We don't know. And uh, that's all I can give you because the Bible doesn't say. And whatever text it's referring to, Assumption of Moses, there's only parts of that that survived, and that part didn't isn't here today, so we don't know. Interesting. I got more questions out of that one. (laughs) To avoid going down rabbit holes, I'm actually going to skip the crowd thing because we're running a little bit late, so we're going to keep moving here. Um, This was cool. I reworded this question a little bit. Um, Great question, though. It says, my spouse has done serious things to hurt our marriage relationship. Should I still forgive them? What can I do to help an estranged spouse going through the darkest time when we have no contact? 
So this was a two-part question. So I'm going to take each question in part. First one was, if a spouse has done serious things to hurt our marriage relationship, should I still forgive him or them? And I believe the answer is definitely yes. But I think it's important to clarify what forgiveness means, right? Um, So God commands us to forgive in light of the forgiveness he's given us. Matthew 18, 21 through 35, and it's also in Ephesians. Um, And in Ephesians 4, like, it seems to indicate that unresolved anger gives the devil a foothold in your life. Um, And it's important as you deal with the grief and pain of your spouse's sin, not to allow the devil to gain a foothold on you through bitterness and unforgiveness, you know? Someone else can do something wrong, and you can allow that to cause you to go into a dark place as well. And that's challenging to not do, but it's important. But I think in answering this question, it's important to realize that forgiveness doesn't always mean restoration to the way things were. Um, Forgiveness is freely given. Access and trust in a relationship is earned. And when someone breaks the trust, um, they have to earn back the access that they had before. You know, that comes through showing that they have truly changed, that they're a person of character. Sometimes people get into a cycle, abusive relationships are like this, where someone will hurt the other, they'll really say, I'm sorry, they might bring gifts, they might bring something to show that they're really, really sorry, and they come back in just the way things were before, but nothing ever gets resolved. That person hasn't really changed, and so the cycle continues. It's a never-ending cycle, and it's not good. So it's important that... uh, Restoration involves real repentance. And repentance means turning from one direction and going in another. Boundaries are not unkind. And, and to answer the second question, what can I do to help an estranged spouse going through the darkest time when we have no contact? There's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, there's, there's so many reasons why this situation could happen, so it's a little bit hard to answer. But sometimes in estrangement, there really isn't a whole lot you can do personally. But... I think wherever you're at, if you're in a relationship with somebody, it doesn't even have to be your spouse, but with somebody, family member, whatever, they've hurt you, and maybe they're not ready to fix it. What you can do is you can't fix them, you can't hound them continually, you can't try and make them change, but what you can do is pursue health on your own. This can look like going to counseling to deal with the grief, to deal with whatever you're going through. This can look like getting into activities that are healthy for you. And this definitely looks like filling your mind with the truth, right? Um, And I think it's good in these relationships. Like, I've had this kind of thing with my dad. Like, he's really hurt our family, and I have had to distance myself from him. And it's given me time to try and become a healthy man on my own, to deal with the pain of my past, but also to solidify in my mind what a healthy relationship with my dad needs to look like going forward. You know, like if he ever wants to reconcile and deal with the past, I have a clear idea in my mind what that needs to look like for us to have a healthy relationship, you know. Um, And I think that's a good thing to do when you're dealing with a spousal or other type of relationship that's strained. Um, Think about what a healthy restart to your marriage would look like and take things slow. Don't rush into anything and be, you know, don't allow bitterness to be there. Forgive be open to reconciliation, but be willing to take things slow. Be willing to look for real signs of repentance. Those are, I think, some good guidelines, you know, to consider in this, relation, this kind of situation. I don't really have anything to add. <clears throat> I really like what you said about forgiveness doesn't mean everything looks exactly the same. A lot of people keep repeating the same cycles because we don't get the help we need. We don't see the change we need. You know, help them to take responsibility or what we need to take responsibility for or whatever. We just go right back into it. You know, um, forgiveness with good, healthy boundaries and rebuilding that, that trust and making a healthy relationship is smart. So good stuff, man. Anybody got thoughts about that they want to share? Yeah. No, I think it's, a, it's, it's, the, right, it's the right direction. Uh, great advice. The, uh, the growth part, right? Coming back together, the promise that things will be different. Things will be better, right? Not being the same is uh, is what we're striving, right? 
we, uh, we're working on things to be better, right? So coming back together, you know, it's going to be a new life, new beginning, you know, new interests, new experiences, right? So being healthy, staying on task with ourselves, right? Doing the work, putting in the work, right? As individuals and coming back together mm-hmm. is, uh, is the awesome promise at the end. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. All right. <clears throat> I get all the spiritual warfare questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can demons appear in physical form like angels do? Good question. Yeah. Um, so in the Bible, angels often appear uh, as, as humans. Actually, that's primarily the way uh, they... Uh, they appear um, in the Bible. So when you see an angel, usually it probably looks like a, a Hebrew. Unless a it's Hebrew, a wheel. What's that? Unless they're a wheel. That's not an angel, though. <laughs> see, I could, I could really get deep on this. Because, uh, yeah, there's been this whole thing. Well, this is a biblical angel now, you know, because everybody's, you know, because everybody had this misnomer that angels are these things with wings flying. And so people come out and say, well, this is more of a biblical angel. And then they talk about a seraphim or, or whatever. The Bible never says those are angels. Angels are messengers, right? So there's the Elohim, there's the, the, the spiritual world, the spiritual beings, but they're not all angels. So in the Bible, not all those things are angels. So I can get off on a tangent, but <laughs> angels often appear in human form, right? Um, Genesis, in Genesis 6, some interpret, you know, the sons of God came and married the daughters of men. There's different interpretations of that, but one of the primary Jewish interpretations is that those sons of God were um, angels uh, taking human form, okay? So, it, you know, if that's the case, at the time, they were good angels and probably sent on assignment from, from God, right? And so, <clears throat> they took on... Um, uh, human form, and they were probably, yeah, they were probably on assignment from God, given permission um, from God in that instance, and then they rebelled. Um, demons, on the other hand, so they, they possess people in the scriptures, but um, the Bible never mentions them taking human form. So entities that are, that are already evil, uh, the Bible never mentions them taking human forms. Uh, also, and this is something really don't have the time to get into here, um, but demons may may differ, be different from fallen angels. So there may be some difference uh, there as well, and not quite the same thing. But in the Bible, we never really see either one take on human form. They possess people, right? Demons possess people, but they don't take on uh, human form. And, and this is just Scott 2 and 2 speculation, and uh, I think even probably for good angels too, is my guess is that they need God's permission and power in order to do so. Um, so, um, Last week we had the question on spiritual warfare, and you talk and made me think. There's a guy named Michael Heiser that has a lot of really good stuff um, as far as like the spiritual realm goes. Um, like I said last time, people can get into some really weird ideas about the spiritual realm, but Michael Heiser is uh, no longer alive, but he was a very accomplished scholar. He's, yeah, scholar and uh, very studious. He has a lot of great stuff. So if you want some really solid information on spiritual realm. That's good be, and, and because yeah. there's a lot of crazy stuff out there too, and that's right. a guy that I trust. So I'm not saying I agree with him on everything, you know what I mean? But he is, he is studious. He's a serious scholar. It's not just a bunch of kooky stuff that you, that you might see, so... All right, we got two more questions. I saw your hand up, but we're going we're gonna to move on. Sorry, sorry. I, come to us afterwards because I'd love to hear it. But we uh, just want to make sure we get out of here on time. So, um, and these next two questions have a little bit of an answer to them. So, um, all right. This one says, if you've been baptized before but feel like you want or need to rededicate your life to God, what is it that you need to do? Um, good question. I thought that was cool. Um, to answer the question, I want to share a verse from Colossians that I think is really cool. It says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And what's cool about this verse to me is this part here, so as, or 
in the same way that you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. And when you become a Christian, what is going on? You're recognizing God's love for you. You recognize that you need God's forgiveness. You're ready to turn away from your sin, and you trust God to help you do that, to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life, to help you to start to walk down a new path. That's how you begin this life with God. It's accepting what Jesus did for us by faith. It's recognizing his love, our need. We're ready to turn away from sin, and we trust him to help us do that. That's how you begin, okay? And so what this verse is saying is that in that same way, the same way you begin your relationship with God is the same way you continue in your relationship with God. Let, let me show you this verse, and then I'll kind of tie it together. First John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Walking with God every day is recognizing his love for you, recognizing that you need him and you need his forgiveness. Um, coming to a place daily where you're ready to turn away from your sin and you're trusting God to help you do it. It's a day-by-day walk. And just, just how you start that relationship with God, the next day, it's the same thing. It's that continual coming back to God. And so when you realize whether you've strayed for God, whether you've been getting into something you shouldn't have for an hour or for two weeks or for a couple months, if you feel like you've been walking away from God for a while, coming back to him, there's no ritual you have to perform. There's no special thing you have to do to rededicate your life to God. The word rededicate is not in the Bible. It's something we've kind of come up with, you know, but it's, I mean, if you want to get baptized again, if it's been long, you can do that. If you want to talk to a pastor to help you in counsel, that's great too, and we're always open for that. But to boil it down to the brass tacks, like coming back to God, rededicating your life to God is just as simple as you realizing you need him, you've been in a wrong place, you ask him for forgiveness, you turn away from what you've been doing, and you trust him to help you get back on the right path. It's just that simple. And it's a day-by-day thing because when the day you do it, the day you rededicate your life to God, the next day you're going to have to do it again because that temptation is going to come calling, you know? There's no baptism or anything else isn't some sort of special ritual that empowers you. And I think we have to be careful. Let me take it back. Baptism is spiritual and it's special. But it's not going to be the thing that gets you back on track. It's a heart issue, you know? You can get baptized 10 times, keep walking away from God. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, like the prodigal son, he didn't have to do anything special. And he actually thought he did. He's like, I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to tell him, I'm sorry. I'm going to be like, dad, make me a servant. I'll, I'll be a slave for you just to get back into your favor. And the son, the dad was like, I don't need any of that. I can see your heart has changed. You're ready to start a new path. Welcome back. It's just as simple as that. And that's how we start. And that's how we walk with God. Many times throughout the day, I realize I've been thinking the wrong way. I've been having a bad heart attitude. And I got to do a little rededication, a little reorientation with God every day. You know, when I say, God, I'm sorry, I need your help. I ask for your forgiveness and I trust you to help me. And so I think it's just as simple as that. It's really good. Any thoughts on that, anybody? Silence. Hey, it's 11-11 if anybody cares about that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. This is the last question. If only God has the power and authority to forgive sins, then why are we told to forgive each other? All right. So there's two types of forgiveness. I think that's the distinction that needs to be made that can help us to understand uh, what's going on here. In Mark chapter 2... uh, some guys had, uh, Jesus was teaching in a house and they couldn't get to him. Their friend was um, uh, paralyzed and they, the, through the crowd they couldn't get to him. So um, they took him up through the roof and, and lowered him down. You know, they, and, and Jesus commended uh, their faith, right, in doing that because they were working hard because they knew that if, you know, that Jesus could heal them. And so he says in Mark 2, uh, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I think that may be where this question is is, is coming from. 
Well, then we look, and I can go plenty of other places, but I just grabbed one, Ephesians uh, 4, 32. Paul says, be kind to one another, church, uh, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Well, how in the world can we do that if only God can forgive uh, sins? All right, so next slide. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I see two types of forgiveness in, uh, in the scriptures. Um, there's divine uh, forgiveness, uh, uh, salvific uh, forgiveness is maybe another word for it, but there's divine forgiveness. And then there's relational uh, forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> One is authoritative. Only God can do that. That's what the, the Pharisees were, were talking about. Who is this guy to, to, to forgive the sins? Because Jesus, in forget, when he was talking about for, saying this man, his sins are forgiven, it was an authoritative pardon of his sins that allows us into God's kingdom. Uh, it reconciles us back to God in relationship with him. Uh, when you first place your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, you receive the forgiveness of sins, and that is a divine pardon of your, of your sins. Um, now, one thing, just a side note, God is always, you see in the Old Testament and even before Jesus died on the cross, God has always been able to forgive sins in this way, but it required an atonement. So that's why in the Old Testament, even though they didn't know it was Jesus, they were looking forward to um, uh, the Messiah. They may not have understood that, but the Messiah had to come, right? There had to be <laughs> that atonement uh, for sin. That's what was uh, required. And then now we look back in Thanksgiving um, for, that, for that atonement. Um, as uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, that's the next one. Sorry, bud. Um, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? But God was always able to do that. It was just that shedding of the blood had to, to happen in, in the atonement. That's why we have the cross. Um, and so that's, the, that's divine forgiveness, right? <clears throat> the other is relational, and that's the responsibility of us all. So we can't divinely pardon anybody's, anybody's sin, but we can uh, forgive them and you spoke about this earlier. You know, it's about releasing resentment, bitterness, and anger in us, right? Um, it's about taking our hands off of the person's throat so that they can breathe, especially the more we understand Christ, you know, and we love other people and even our enemies. We want to see them reconciled back to God, you know, and, and uh, so we, in forgiveness, we take uh, our hands off of their throats and really take our hands off our own throats because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, when you're uh, when you're in unforgiveness, you're, you're the one drinking the poison, you know, um, and it makes you bitter, you know, and it puts you in a bad place. I believe that's why Jesus said, um, you know, hey, reconcile with your brother or, or, or else you're going to be in, in jail until you pay the last penny. I don't think he's necessarily talking about final judgment. He's talking about in this life, if you're living in unforgiveness, you're, you're, you're putting yourself in prison, right? You're imprisoning um, yourself, um, and I do believe when we forgive others, it prepares the way for the gospel of divine forgiveness and pardon, especially us, right? Jesus tells us how important it is for us as believers to forgive our neighbor. How in the world are they going to see Jesus in us if we're not willing to forgive them? You know what I mean? And so I believe it opens the way um, for the gospel. And also within the church, it nurtures peace and unity and love, uh, not only in the church, but also out there um, in the world. And so, you know, lastly, I believe that even as Christians, though, um, we should still confess our sins to God, not for divine forgiveness. When, when you trust as Jesus as Lord and Savior, says in Christ there is no condemnation, the good news is that your, your sins are divinely forgiven, past, present, and future. Divinely pardoned, all gone, separated as far as the east is from the west. But just like we walk in relationship with each other, if I wrong Luke, it's good. I should take responsibility for that, right? And I should tell Luke, man, I'm sorry, dude. I did you wrong. I know that hurt you. You know, would you forgive me? Um, you know, and I know, you know, Luke, you know, tries to love me unconditionally, but it hampers our relationship, right? And so I believe, um, you know, in keeping a healthy relationship with God, um, you know, we always think about it, oh, am I, you know, am I saved or not? It's not all about salvation. It's just about having a healthy relationship with our, our creator. You know, and you kind of spoke to that uh, a little bit ago. So I accept your apology. Thank you. <laughs>
appreciate that. I know the impact that that had on you. Just kidding. Were you done? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I thought I was interrupting. No. No. That's good. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, anybody have thoughts about that? I don't have much to add to that. Here, here comes Brandon. It's just like that little cartoon up there. When you hold something, unforgiveness in your heart. He's, he's uh, asked forgiveness and he's, he's uh, set free. Look at him. Mm-hmm. He's free yeah. mm-hmm. because he's, he's repented. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he has forgiveness too. So it just sets you free. Yeah, it's good, Mom. It really does. There's a verse in, yes, oh, we'll get to you in just a second. We got Sabrina and Warren. Okay, cool. There's a verse in Hebrews that talks about be watchful that no root of bitterness springs up, and through it many become defiled. And uh, that's what happens when you hold on to unforgiveness. And it can feel so justified because that person was wrong, you know? And so you can hold on to bitterness and anger against them, but it poisons you. It really does. It poisons the way you think. It poisons the decisions you make, you know? Um, It can allow you to justify things that you shouldn't be doing because, well, they did this to me, so, you know, it's only fair or it's only right or whatever. Um, Man, letting go of that hatred is difficult, and bitterness is difficult, but it's right. And when you do, it's, it's like freedom that, you know? So just reiterating what both of you have already said. I was just going to kind of say the same thing too, but um, one for me, you know, holding unforgiveness for a certain deal for over 30 something years, it does, it eats at you. But what I realized is that I allowed that person to have power over me, the way that I felt, the way that I acted, the way that um, I did things. But then when I realized that that person is, you know, doing whatever they want to do. They don't care what they've done to me. It never affected them. Um, and then here I wasted all that time and all that energy, you know, spinning in a cycle um, that God never wanted me to be in in the, in, in the you know, the first place. And then, you know, like, like Mimo said and, and like that picture, forgiveness is for us. It's to set us free. And, and to, to break the chains of holding us captive to all of those things. And not only that, but like I told the ladies on Friday, is that we put all those things in our hearts, and it takes up residence, residence there. So if we have all of that going on in our heart, how can we allow God to come and dwell in our hearts, the fullness of God? We can't, mm-hmm. because we got all that stuff there. But when we remove it and we give it to Him and he takes control of it, then he can start moving into those parts of, those, of our heart where those things have held captive and start healing us. That's when we become, I vision a fly, the butterfly. We become that new creation that God tells us about, that we become already. But we, we get to see the fruits of it, I yeah. guess is what I'm trying to yeah. say. We get to look in the mirror and, and, and say, you know, I see what Jesus sees. Yeah. And I, so, that's a good... It's good, Brady. That's wisdom. It's mm-hmm. good. Warren? I was thinking about my experience in years past with unforgiveness. Not just in years past, but my the big part of my life. The inability I felt, the the almost to a point of hatred towards certain people that had hurt me so badly in life. And my experience reached the point where it began to affect my health. Not it, it went beyond. Once I, it went so far in how it affected me that once I did begin to forgive, the lingering physical and nervous effects were still there. It's a poison that has a lasting unforgiveness has a lasting effect. So one of the things all of us need to look in our heart because just the realization of our, our humanity. It's something I think, uh, as believers, we need to guard against. Um, I, got, I woke up. I got woken up <laughs> a few years ago. Woke. I became uh, authentically woke. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was... Another discussion, Warren. Yes, yeah, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, awoke in the sense of 
there was people that had hurt me so badly through the years, not just emotionally, but even physically, and things that had happened. And then I even like look at people that I would even wonder, did they even realize? Well, then I began to, I found out that I had been that object of grief in someone else's eyes, and I didn't even know it. And it was an, what we would call an almost an innocent, what I call that, an innocent slight. I had no idea how it affected that person. And it, and it burned in their heart for years. And so I think it, it comes down to the, you know, all of us, you know, as, as believe, we're, we're humanity, we're a mess. And so search our, you know, seek to forgive to get that out of our heart because it kills us. But also, on the other side of that, search deep to find out, have we ourselves? It's to think, you know, thinking in the other person's, trying to, how can I word this? Try to think about the other person on a whole another level in my relation to other people, if that makes sense. I hope I'm explaining this well. <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, that was the wake-up thing for me, is all that bitterness. And then I, one day, it dawned, while I'm harboring all these people that had hurt me, authentically hurt me, then it dawned on me one day that, hey, I've hurt other people too. And I'm not talking about, I'm not saying this within the, uh, I don't, I'm not trying to say that we're all like this. No. But it's something that I had to realize when I did that, that's when I realized that I was killing myself. And anyway, and that's where we think about that divine forgiveness is such a beautiful thing. <laughs> we're, 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 you know, the, the Lord squares us up with him. And anyway. That's Warren, one thing, thing I like about what I heard you say is, is I've hurt other people too. And I was just kind of writing in my, not my notes for this, but just my own personal, you know, notes. Yeah. Uh, this morning was um, <clears throat> I was thinking like how often do we you know speaking of forgiveness how often do we ask for forgiveness of others you know and some of us are really good at it and, you know I'm not saying we're all bad at it some of us are, are good at taking responsibility but I wonder if you if you can't really think of times where you've asked for forgiveness from somebody else I would just invite you to be curious about why that might be so is that saying something why are you you know why do you struggle to say you're sorry or to ask for somebody's forgiveness because i think that can give us a lot of perspective warren is when the more we learn to take responsibility for ourselves you know what i mean and what's crazy is we're we got this whole pride thing you know we're we're afraid of the shame of like going to tell somebody you know that we're sorry or that we did wrong and it, it's weird you know to see how we struggle with that but yet like man <laughs> I admire somebody so much that's able to genuinely say they're sorry and they're at fault. I don't think less of that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I admire uh, people who can do that. But, man, why do we struggle so much to say we're sorry and to ask for forgiveness of, uh, from other people? So, Good stuff. Great input. Appreciate you all pitching in. Um, what well, I saw we got. This is... A wrap up for Ask the Pastors series. We had so many questions. Went from one week to three. Appreciate y'all submitting questions. Now, we didn't actually get to all of them. Some of them, um, we just didn't have time. So some of them I'll try to answer on signal. Um, some of them were silly, so that's why we didn't get to them. But uh, we tried to prioritize the serious ones. Kevin. But, Sorry uh, we didn't get to the unicorns <laughs> question, whoever uh, asked what happened to the unicorn. But... Uh, if we can't, if I don't feel like I can answer it succinctly on signal, we'll just save it for the next time we do this.